Good after, no, good morning. Um, wow, these are the hardcore environment Virginia people. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Elizabeth, so Mike's running out the door. I'm calling you out, calling you out. Um, he's like, Elizabeth's got the mic, I'm out of here. So um, I'm Elizabeth Andrews. I direct the Virginia Coastal Policy Center at William Mary Law School. And I wanna draw your attention to the fact that this is not Ann Goodman. It's a moment for, for obvious statements. Um, the program uh, needed to be updated a bit. So we have with us today a slightly different situation. I am gonna be the moderator of the panel. And we have with us today, David Fridley, environmental health manager with the Three Rivers Health District. Um, thank you for coming and joining us. And Tanya Denkla Cobb, who directs the Institute for Engagement and Negotiation at UVA. And um, we're gonna have a very informal kind of conversation after they do some PowerPoint presentations. And what we're talking about today is innovative strategies. So that'll be a fun way to end the day, the conference, um, and trying to reach certain communities, which is very difficult. And it's really a great cumulative conversation because yesterday when we had our panel on a truly resilient Virginia, I'm gonna call out Wendy because she did a great job. And we talked about how too often it is our lower income minority communities that are moved. And we talk a lot in the resilience community about managed retreat. And that's a great concept, except for the folks who are having to live it, right? It's a cultural uprooting as well as a physical uprooting. And too often projects in low income communities may not be able to pass that cost benefit uh, ratio that is required for grant programs. And it's the higher income communities that get to stay in place with protections. And so how can we reach these communities if they have, for example, septic failures, David's the pro on that, along with I see some VDH folks in the audience who are the other pros. Lance was just talking about, how do we reach these individual property owners and find out what kind of uh, system they have? You know, is it a septic system? Is it a community system? Um, and so we're gonna talk a bit about the RAFT, which is a project that is a partnership between Tanya's program at UVA and my program at William Mary Law School and the Old Dominion University Institute for Coastal Adaptation and Resilience, ICAR, which many of you all have heard of, I'm sure. And um, we've been doing it for quite a number of years now, trying to reach down into the communities and work with them. And now we have a new targeted approach to reach the grassroots down in the community even more so, and she's gonna talk about that. So I think I'll kick it off with Tanya doing the first presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's it's uh, so great to see you all and just a big shout out. Thank you for being here. <laughs> really hardcore, gold stars. Um, so let me just see here. So this is, I think, the third or fourth year that we've presented about the RAFT, which is stands for Resilience Adaptation Feasibility Tool. And it started really with a request from representatives back in 2015 of localities who were saying, we really need some help in helping localities at the grassroots level achieve and make some kind of concrete change towards resilience. The studies, the mapping, um, the projections, all of that's great, but the localities are not able to really take this information and do something with it. So we came together and this became the goal of the raft in response to what I would say really a bottoms up request um, to help Virginia, Virginia's coastal localities improve resilience to flooding and other coastal storm hazards while very importantly, very importantly, striving to thrive both economically and socially. So it's oftentimes um, one of those things we're taught, we're really trying to take a holistic approach to community resilience. And so the things that we really drove us as we started putting this whole process together, it's an 18 month process, um, is that the community really needs to be in the driver's seat and that they need to be the ones deciding, identifying, developing, what it is that they want to do, what are their priorities. So often we heard criticisms of other organizations parachuting in and then giving the typical sort of consultant recommendations, which were really not helpful. And then the community was left with them and nothing much happened. 
So it really needed to be from the community, by the community, for the community. And that our role was to be providing support adapted to each locality's needs. And one of the things we really felt strongly about, as Elizabeth said, trying to reach those localities that are under-resourced, that we need to find a way to bring it at no cost. And let me tell you, that has been a perennial annual issue. We have just, it has been piecing funding together year to year, but we've made it happen. And these are some of the funders in more recent years that have really helped us a lot. A uh, big call out to the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund that's helped us in the Northern Neck and Middle Peninsula. Virginia Environmental Endowment has been with us from the beginning as well as the DEQ Coastal Zone Management Program. And then of course, we are all donating in a way, staff, time, and, um, and C Grant is also a part of that uh, through ODU. And so uh, Elizabeth has also, has already told you about our three university partnership, which in and of itself is a bit of a unicorn. If anybody has worked with universities, you know that is quite unusual. Um, so that's an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, this is a little bit of where we started. We started with three pilots. Uh, it took us a couple of years to really put the process together, develop a scorecard that was drawn from the UN and uh, any kind of sustainability and um, resilience scorecard we could, we could find. Um, and we pieced something together that we felt would be holistic. So we started with three pilot localities, a city, county, and town in different parts of the coastal zone, and, um, and then held a social equity focus group, which really then looked at our scorecard and said, here's how it how social equity needs to be woven throughout. We were toying with the idea of a separate category for social equity. They said, no, 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 no. It needs to be part and parcel of every piece of this scorecard. So then we started with working with the Eastern Shore, seven localities, Northern Neck, seven localities, Middle Peninsula, we're finishing up with, six, well, really just getting started with the implementation teams of six localities. And Crater is also, we're starting to do the scoring for that. So you can see we're sort of moving through the coast, learning, learning, learning a lot. And that's what we're here to share with you today. Um, so these are things that you all know about. What's at risk for communities? I don't think I need to run through this. This is, this is what you live and breathe. Um, so, but here's the question, which of these risks may have greater impact on, on what we, we are coming to call historically excluded and underserved. I heard this morning um, from Chair Mallory that uh, a, a slightly new term, which is under, underserved and overburdened um, communities, populations. Um, oftentimes I'll just say that people talk about BIPOC, I have been I have been reading and learning that some people may feel marginalized by the use of that term. So I just wanted to call out our use of terms uh, because it, it is a lumping term and it's not necessarily helpful to lump. There are times when it's important to talk about indigenous and not all tribes are the same, right? We know that. So just, I'm trying to call out some of these learnings, lessons, um, awareness issues that are really important as we all work in this domain. So what's, what risks may have greater impacts? All the same. I went, all of the same risks have greater impacts on um, under-resourced, vulnerable, overburdened communities. So this is, I mean, classic kind of look at what goes into resilience, economic, environmental, social, nothing new to all of you. But what is really interesting is we found that most programs either focus on the environmental infrastructure, what can we do to, to um, have a living shoreline? What do we do about the roads? What do we do about critical facilities? You know, or they may be worried about economics, right? What happens to the economy of the community when something has happened that really is impacting their resilience? Very few, if any, have been so focusing on the social dimension of resilience. And that's where we're trying 
to move and to stretch into. And I'm, I'm being really honest that this is, this, is, this is a work in progress. So this is just to, to show you on the scorecard, which has a hundred different metrics that cover um, five different categories of policy and leadership, risk assessment, emergency management, infrastructure planning. And then the one on the far right that historically through every region that we've worked with has always been the lowest and has always caused this reaction of, why are we talking about health and well being as part of resilience? Why is that part of resilience? Help us understand that. So that's in and of itself sort of a wake up call that people are not seeing resilience in the holistic manner. And so the scorecard that we bring and is an educational tool in and of itself. So our process is 18 months, as I said, it's got the scorecard, it's got setting priorities from the, by the community at a community workshop, and then it's a year of support from our three universities in implementing those priorities that they have identified. So what's in red here, this is the new piece that we want to talk about, is we said, you know, we're not really doing well at reaching the people who we have wanted to have at the table. So how do we do this? COVID hit and we had a small grant. Um, um, well, actually, let me, let me hold that, hold on. So I'll say, I'll go back to this, is what we have added as a new piece into our process that is that we are also doing extensive interviews and focus group outreach to organizations serving historically excluded and underserved populations. And I'll tell you more about what that looks like in a minute. Okay, so how are needs of the, of the vulnerable, historically excluded and underserved identified? Well, they're throughout all the five categories. Okay, I'm moving on, I've said this. So what we basically learned is that, you know what, if, these groups that are at highest risk, whether it's low income, whether it's racial, whether it's tribal, what, if they're not at the table, there's an old adage, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? You're not being considered. Your interests are not being there. And we found that, that um, when the communities were at the workshop, identifying their priorities, they were focusing on the priorities of the organizations present, right? Makes total sense. So how do we get these people to the table? Um, so that, hold on. So we started to think about how do we identify the full range of vulnerability? And we came up with this list of, it's not complete, but it's a beginning uh, to start opening up people's eyes to all the different ranges of types of vulnerabilities, that there are historical traumas that create a kind of vulnerability because it creates a complete distrust in the government. And so they're not going to trust when the government is saying move out or evacuate or they don't trust the government's message about something around on-site septic, right? Their septic system is failing, we can help, right? So they, they don't trust the messenger. And so the historic traumas are an important thing to be considering. Income, uh, language, mental illness, substance abuse, all of that, um, limited mobility, migrant workers, um, the lack of reliable internet. When we're working in the Northern Neck, the issue of, of a culture that does not work with mod modern amenities, may not have phones like the Amish, um, Mennonites or others, um, connection to historic or cultural resources such as tribal nations where, hey, this is their history that is here that may be flooded, that may be gone and lost forever. So all of these are different things to be thinking about. So, um, we developed this worksheet to work with localities that had said, we need to find a way to reach the more vulnerable. How do we identify them? And so we created this worksheet with this beginning list of potential populations to consider for vulnerability. And we basically said, let's think about all of the different types of risks that 
could be occurring during, be, during or after an event that occurs. And then let's look at each of these categories for that. So maybe it's flooding roads, maybe it's businesses, preparation, right? Who needs to be considered and who in your county might be at risk? And so it's a very systematic worksheet. We worked with two counties on doing this. This was a, a brand new idea. They were willing to be our pilots in, in the Northern Neck and they um, found it to be incredibly eye-opening, awareness raising and allowed them to begin to rethink their planning for emergency management and, um, and their comp plan issues and their hazard mitigation issues as well. So um, that this the output of this worksheet gets fed into the hazard mitigation plan and emergency operations plan. This is a just a quick look of what the worksheet looks like. So back to um, what I mentioned before is something that happened when COVID hit that really was another it was a big turning point for us. We got a very small grant to look at the um, impacts of COVID on critical services. And what happened was we did outreach, which were consisted of 18 interviews um, and four focus groups. We ended up reaching 68 individuals and over 40 organizations. And what we learned was this, these were organizations that had never been at the RAF table, faith leaders, all kinds, I'll show you a list in a bit. And what we learned was that all of these organizations work with the socially vulnerable, or the historically excluded, um, and they are so focused on what they're doing that they had not yet thought about climate resilience. That was a new item to be added to their list. And they're like, oh my gosh, we have not yet started to work on this with the people we serve. Can we be included? Hallelujah, that was music to our ears, right? Yes, that's what we're aiming for. So that is why we started to say this has got to be, we hope that this can be a continued part of our raft process. Um, and so um, in the Middle Peninsula, we did, we've done this. We did four focus groups, 15 interviews, and we also did a survey. Um, and what we ended up uh, there's a lot that we did with it. What comes out of these interviews and surveys and focus groups is identifying what they have said is the challenges and identifying what they say are the opportunities. And it's qualitatively different from what comes out of the scorecard. So together we take the information from the metrics from the scorecard where you saw the bar charts, right? What they were weak on. And we're using this qualitative information from these focus groups and individual interviews and combining them into a new opportunity list that can be considered at this community workshop when they identify their goals for the next year. These are the kinds of groups that we have reached out to. Um, social services, Red Cross, uh, shelters, crisis centers, elderly service providers, food banks, libraries turn out to be one of the core, most important sort of uh, nexus points for community information, outreach. Um, Faith-based organizations is maybe one of the most important networks that need to be reached. Um, tribal nations, uh, community colleges, all of these were so important. So findings, uh, Elizabeth, have I blown through my time? No. Okay. I have you six more minutes. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay, great. So what we have found is that the strengths and assets really are the collaboration that these networks are, they exist, but they may not exist for resilience. And, and that's what needs to be, I loved the word that um, Chair Mallory um, used this morning of animated. They need to be animated for resilience and inform and build their awareness around resilient, climate resilience. Um, how organizations work together to address resiliency is through these partnerships, fund sharing, sharing funds and conversations. It's 
it's all of the informal networks, but unless we are able to tap into them, we're not gonna, not gonna reach them. The challenges, nothing new here. I'm sure all of you could, could understand this. Internet is one of the biggest issues. Transportation for people, um, affordable housing, funding for these agencies that serve the underserved and overburdened. Um, we have found that the historically excluded and underserved are certainly low income. That's a common group that is called out. It's rural African-American, it is tribal, it is youth, and it is elderly. And those are sort of the, the, the top tiers, right? But others, uh, that whole other list is in play. So there are so many opportunities we found to, um, what's really interesting is, is you're saying, well, why, are, why do we need to work on affordable housing to have climate resilience? That's not really how we're thinking about it. But what we're learning from the communities is that is how we need to think about it. That these are in, integral aspects of creating climate resilience that if you don't have affordable housing, you have more of a people who are homeless, you have people who are, are afloat, maybe literally in, in times of dire, you know, extreme storms. Um, so people need a place to live and they need transportation. Um, and so many of these rural areas that we've been working with are, there's not sufficient transportation for people to get to food, to get to medicine, to get to these places. So in the Middle Peninsula, for example, one of the communities we're working with has said, we need to create a new model where we're bringing the food and the medicine to people rather than trying to get them out to. So it's sort of like if you think about Meals on Wheels, but it's for medicine, it's for it's for daily food, not the occasional two, two times a week food from Meals on Wheels. It's being able to shop that way, right? Um, it's being able to order your medicines up that way and know that they can be delivered that way in rural areas. It's there for urban people, it's not there for rural. Okay, so these are um, opportunities that we have found. I've talked about a number of these. Childcare services is a huge thing for um, resilience and, and it goes for climate resilience as well. Imagine trying to manage your children while you are trying to rebuild or clean up or uh, prepare. I mean, all of this is part and parcel of what needs to be thought about that really has not yet been on people's radar from my perspective. Um, lessons learned, um, let me pick and choose a few of these. Um, COVID was in a way we know, um, I'm sure we all know the horrors of what has happened with COVID. I don't think there's any one of us that has, has not been touched personally at this point by COVID in some way. You've also heard some people talk about how COVID has become a blessing in some ways because it has surfaced and revealed um, disparities that we've known about for a very long time and it's forcing us to look at them. And what we're looking at through COVID is that it has also done that with regard to climate resilience. We believe that it has revealed the kinds of things that we need to be looking at with climate resilience that we did not necessarily want to see or acknowledge before. Um, I think I've talked about most of the rest of these. So with that, um, I'm going to say that's it until we have our conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon, you brave and hardy souls. Thanks for uh, sticking it out. I hear there's some uh, interesting weather on the way. I appreciate you uh, staying here. Uh, again, I'm David Fridley. I work for the Virginia Department of Health 
and I'm the Environmental Health Manager for Three Rivers Health District, uh, which is uh, the area between the uh, uh, Potomac and York Rivers. I'm facing the uh, Chesapeake Bay. And if you were here earlier to hear Louis Lawrence talk about the, uh, the work that he, through the Middle Peninsula Planning District Commission, is doing, those are uh, uh, very similar areas. What I'd like to talk about today are some uh, context issues regarding rural wastewater uh, impacts and challenges that are imposed by climate change and sea level rise, uh, looking at uh, current and future vulnerable populations, but most importantly, really about talking to people. So talking about talking to people. It's really an exciting time, specifically in terms of wastewater in rural areas, uh, because uh, recently enacted changes to the uh, Code of Virginia are clarify that our state policy in regarding community and on-site wastewater treatment is to protect public health and provide universal access to appropriate wastewater treatment through public education, collaboration, prioritizing, uh, looking at community-based versus single property by property projects, uh, integrating individual on-site systems and public or centralized sewer systems, and uh, very much importantly, incorporating the effects of climate change into our regulatory and our funding programs. Uh, as part of that, uh, there is established a wastewater infrastructure policy working group, which includes a laundry list of uh, important folks, including directory of the Department of Environmental Quality, state health commissioner, Director of the Department of Housing and Community Development, the Executive Director of the Resource, Virginia Resources Authority, Secretaries of Natural and Historic Resources, Commerce and Trade, of Health and Human Resources, all providing staff report. Also, the Center for Coastal Resource Management at VIMS and the Virginia Coastal Policy Center at William and Mary Law School, all advising the working group. I'm gonna be speaking from the perspective of a local health department practitioner trying to deal with these issues with the local community where I live and I work. Um, some of the uh, aspects that we see here on the south slide, the uh, top illustration is a septic system vulner vulnerability map uh, made by uh, Virginia Institute of Marine Science showing uh, prevalence of septic system replacements and repairs in coastal areas. And uh, the lower slide is a photograph I took uh, behind a, uh, on a gas station in Northumberland County. In, uh, and uh, this old four holer privy is uh, definitely must have been a very uh, busy uh, uh, establishment at the time. Still standing, but not, I think, in use. So these rural areas can be characterized, <clears throat> excuse me, as wastewater islands. And this is uh, certainly not an idea that uh, I came up with, but uh, some of our uh, folks at the Virginia Department of Health, including uh, audience members, helped generate the concept of wastewater islands. And those are areas, <clears throat> excuse me, which do not have adequate access to uh, wastewater solutions for their residents. There are environmental factors, including no access to centralized sewerage, soils that are not well suited for traditional septic systems, sensitive receiving environments with uh, groundwater concerns, other water quality issues, uh, TMDL uh, programs, small lot sizes with older uh, residential subdivisions, older homes and communities, uh, actively failing on-site systems that are backing up into the house, discharging to the ground service surface, or discharging directly into waterways with uh, straight pipes or uh, other aspects of septic system failures. There are social factors, which are historical inequities that we've uh, discussed. Lower education specifically regarding environmental and public health issues, and of course always financial situations, low income, difficulty getting a loan, which always requires a good credit score, difficulty raising funds for the installation of repair septic systems, and difficulty paying for the ongoing maintenance cost of these systems, which especially for alternative or engineered systems can be hundreds of dollars a year or more. 
Uh, this is just a screen grab from, uh, from Google Maps, and it's a location that I was at on a drive. Uh, I was accompanying a reporter recently who's doing a story on sea level rise, uh, climate change, and septic systems. Uh, we stop here for a couple of reasons, one of which is uh, this is a, a low to moderate income area. It's in Gloucester County on the Middle Peninsula. Uh, a modest home here on the right hand side and a hideously expensive uh, septic system in the front yard. That's the, uh, the mound that you can see there. They've actually done a really good job continuing to mow. It looks like probably with the push mower. And you know, uh, if it weren't for the Phragmites on the other side of the road, it might look like any other uh, sort of coastal neighborhood. Why did we stop? Uh, because I said, oh, come here, look at, the, uh, look at the road ditch here. This is not shown in the picture. Uh, and I don't know how old this photograph is, but the road ditches were uh, full of flowing water at the time. The reporter said, well, uh, it's been raining a lot lately. Isn't that true? And I said, yes, but look really closely. And there was a school of fish swimming in the road ditch. And I said to the reporter, you know, when you have fish in the ditch in front of your house, you really are having a problem. And he got, got, the, got the concept there. So this is a rural area that does not have a wastewater infrastructure, so to speak, just a collage, a jigsaw puzzle of individual situations and systems. I will give you a little bit of a uh, context for that. This is just an overhead view. The house that I showed is just below uh, Tony Lane in the picture. And uh, this, I guess, is an off-season photograph. What you're seeing here, if it's not pine trees, is uh, marsh and tidal marsh. So these are literally going to be island dwellers within a short period of time. So what I'd like to do next is, well, first I'll give you a little wider context. Um, this is a map. It's a, a portion of a map done by John Smith uh, or somebody working for John Smith in about 1607. It's his map of the Chesapeake Bay. It reflects about 20 voyages he took over a bunch of years. He sailed 2,500 miles in four modern states to make this map. Uh, looking at it today, I think it's really astonishing how accurate it is considering the resources he had available and the scope of work that was involved. Uh, and I live near the center of this map in Lancaster County, Virginia, where Europeans started settling there uh, in the early 1640s. And you can see that uh, really uh, there has not been a lot of uh, geographical change in the last 400 years. This is uh, Lancaster County in, in both maps. So I want to shift now and talk about talking to people about changes and changes that might happen. Uh, and we are always talking about projections, modeling, and uncertainty. And when I say uncertainty, the public will often hear that something may happen or it might not happen. Nobody really knows the future is uncertain. But if a climate scientist talks about uncertainty, they're talking about within a predictable range, like this cone of uncertainty for a hurricane, the outcome will vary depending on the inputs. And as a result of which, we get a bunch of different uh, graphs showing uh, historical trends and trying to project those into the future. Graphs and charts, they can carry a lot of information, but there's also the hazard of glazed eyes when showing them. And a picture is worth a thousand words, and what I'd like to do now is go over, not to show you anything that you probably don't know, uh, but to deliberately use a series of slides that I've used in the past when talking about climate change and sea level rise for this reason. Uh, I'd like you to think about them, not just to look at what I'm saying, but to think to yourself, are these effective communication tools for the general public? What audience do they work for? If I'm talking to a group of people who have faced uh, historical uh, or other, other sorts of inequities, uh, will they work? And if not, how should we change the way that we talk? Just briefly, I'm gonna use a NOAA sea level uh, rise mapper to show here that same spot on the Chesapeake Bay, Lancaster County, where I live today and uh, projections of sea level rise uh, through the end of the century. And we're seeing that as time goes by, not only is sea level rising, 
The shoreline is encroaching. We are now seeing this uh, long peninsula, it's called Windmill Point here, turn into a series of islands. And as time goes by, we're seeing not only are people losing their land, losing their homes, uh, schools, roads, um, emergency services, public water supplies, drain fields, churches, their whole historical way of life, and not just their assets are disappearing. Oh, I will. Which part? And I'll let you know the majority of this uh, long peninsula is mm, about three feet in elevation. So that, that's a, a real poster child for sea level rise. And there are a lot of people that live there, both in mm, high asset value waterfront homes and just about a block inland from all of those, you'll see houses that look more like this, where, where I started off. And these are the folks who uh, may not have the financial assets or the ability to repay loans to connect with uh, funding resources that have typically been available to deal with these. So how do we know all this anyway? There's a large team that's working to improve our, our knowledge. Um, so we definitely have the availability of real, serious original source knowledge and we don't have to rely on what we see in TV, magazines, newspapers, or popular science literature when we talk to people about climate change, sea level rise, and their effects. Um, this is a really eye-watering slide that I'd like to use uh, specifically to talk about how do we get some of this information. Uh, we know that NASA currently has about two dozen satellites, for example, to study another long list, uh, atmospheric chemistry, dynamics, wind, temperature, precipitation, aerosols, other pollutants, clouds, solar reflected radiation, radiation that's being emitted from the earth in terms of heat from the top of the atmosphere, precipitation, soil moisture, sea ice, land ice, snow cover, vegetation, I'll take a breath, changes in the freshwater input and the output of the ocean, evaporation, ice melting, and so forth. There's not a limit on the amount of information and data we have about sea level rise and other aspects of climate change. We also know clearly that climate change through the action of carbon dioxide, again, this is nothing you don't know, raising temperature, increasing weather events, influencing sea level rise and a cascading set of public health impacts, a wide range of health concerns, their effects and the exposures on and subsequent health outcomes that result from the changes in exposure are not equitable based upon resources and demographics of the affected populations. These things we know, but how do we effectively talk to people about these issues? Rule number one, don't be this person because alarmism absolutely leads to fatigue. You have to put yourself in your audience's shoes. Who is that audience? What are their values? Do you know what they already believe? And if you think you know what they already believe, how did you find that out? What motivates them? Are you the right messenger to be talking about this topic? People believe a message when they trust the messenger. And certainly we know that over time, uh, trust has been degrading in what had been traditional authorities uh, of knowledge. Who is, the, who, who is and who can be a trusted source of information about public health, public health policy, environmental policy change and the effects those have upon various communities is a question we really need to be asking. Uh, looking at fairness and justice versus the profits of polluters, loyalty, uh, preserving our natural wonders and being good, stu good stewards, liberty, independence, self-sufficient forms of energy, uh, appealing to human uh, concerns, the safety of our children, uh, and appealing to people's better nature 
in order to help motivate and persuade toward necessary change through channeling the power of groups because group identity is important. We know for sure that limiting harm is a positive outcome. We have to make sure that the solution fits the problem, help people identify how a proposed solution allows them to pursue the priorities and the values that they already care about. We have to link solutions to values that are widely shared already. And we have to be able to communicate in a level that allows people to participate in these changes and participate in the messaging itself because people buy into change that they help to create. And as we certainly have seen over the last few years, people resist change that is imposed from the outside or what is perceived as above. Uh, through a hierarchy of, of power. And it's important to be real, to be clear, and be persuasive. Um, when I first got started in public health in uh, the 20th century, uh, one of my trainers had a business card he gave to me, his name, uh, his contact information, and so forth on the back was a really uh, corny uh, adage, cliche, uh, but I still have the business card and it said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And as corny as it is, I've kept it because uh, every cliche has a little uh, germ of truth. And I think that one actually is just about all true. Uh, so that's, that's a message that I've tried to keep in, in the way that I discuss these issues with everyone. So what I've tried to do here today was talk a little bit about wastewater needs in rural areas. The challenge we, challenges we have with the lack of uh, solid infrastructure, to look at the types of messaging that I have been giving to groups and to other people as a local health practitioner, to try to look at what can be the limitations uh, and the challenges of the way that we present this information uh, with uh, overload of information and uh, how we can address people where they are and how to get people to trust you as a person to help them to advocate for their own change. Thank you. Thank you. Those were great presentations and David even brought toys, animations. So we really appreciate that. So I'm gonna ask our panelists each a question and then I'm gonna open it up to you all to ask questions. So please be preparing some. Um, you know, David, when we were preparing for this panel, um, we talked about how there has to be agreement in communities on the facts and the data. And you really demonstrated how important it is when we're talking about uncertainty. A scientist means one thing and, and the general public hears another. Um, Tanya, can you comment a little bit on how the raft can help with creating that agreement in the community about the data and what's happening, the risks that the communities are facing? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you're, uh, it's an interesting question because with some of the communities that we've worked with, I'm thinking back to the Eastern Shore, they may never have agreed that climate change was happening, right? But they know that their roads are flooding. They know that they're losing shoreline. They know that the habitat is changing. Um, and and they see uh, saltwater intrusion. So, so what I wanna say is that one of the things that we've tried to do in the raft is not to hit them over the head with, as, as David was talking about, is, is like hitting them over the head with all of that data would to, to say, yes, climate change is happening. Um, is, it wasn't gonna go anywhere. Um, so the issue was really, you know, the, the data that we tried to work with was the scorecard of how are you doing in your planning for an emergency storm, which they relate to. And, um, and creating that common knowledge of here's where you are strong as a community. Here's what we have found you are doing really well. And here are the things that really need some attention for you to be fully resilient across all three metrics of social, economic, and, um, and environment. I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but it's sort of like holding back actually from that 
overload of data is a, sometimes a good idea. Yeah, I think we don't bludgeon them with data. But one thing that I've personally found really interesting is when we do these smaller implementation team meetings on a monthly basis with localities, you know, they know that we talk about sea level rise and climate change as a risk. And it'll be the moment when they go, you know, there is that field that when I was young, it never flooded. And it's flooded all the time now. And they can't farm the outer edges of it. Or, you know, it's that bringing it home moment as we're having the discussions about there's a risk there and we need to plan for it. Not inundating them with these specific data points, but just, okay, you're right. We're seeing that road flooding more. Um, but we need to do all we can to help generate that political will to, to address things and, and from the grassroots up. So, um, David, one thing we've seen in the RAF that's changed things a lot with the pandemic is the use of Zoom for some of our meetings. Have you all in the health department been using Zoom much to help bring in people into discussions that, um, that aren't able to otherwise maybe have transportation or childcare to attend something? I guess I want to say that we have, of course, uh, the RAF and the RAF implementation team uh, itself is a great example of that because we've had a, a lot of uh, community uh, stakeholders involved there and uh, both in terms of environmental health, which is the area that I work in, uh, but really uh, subsumed also under population health uh, and promoting uh, community wellness the ability to use uh, not just our traditional remote tools of uh, telehealth and telemedicine, but to bring people together uh, who are who have transportation issues, uh, for example, uh, and are have not been able to gather together in large groups has been really uh, key. Uh, one thing that we have seen uh, also in trying to implement that is that in attempting to make meetings and public gatherings easier through Zoom, We've also encountered the uh, uh, opposite part or the, the dynamic there, which is of the availability of adequate technology for people to participate uh, remotely. So there's, but there's been a give and take in, in both of those. Thank you. I just want to piggyback that, you know, as we've started to open up, I, we're not post COVID yet, so I can't quite say it, is like as things have started to open up, we really wrestled with this issue of, of should we move back to in-person meetings? And we had found that we had more participation virtually because people, it just was so much easier for them to do that. And they could hop on the phone, even if they couldn't get on you know, a Zoom video. And so when we really talked with some of the people, they were saying, I mean, there was a preference for staying virtual for some of the people. We, we're still wrestling with it. We haven't figured this out, but it may be surprising that people may actually prefer to continue to work virtually, even when we know the value of being in person is so huge. And I think it was sometimes the local government representatives that said Zoom is a great thing because it helps more people to come. So they, it's not like they said, we found a significant difference in having it in person, you know? So if you all have thoughts on that, we'd love to hear them. But any final thoughts before I hand the mic over to the audience? Any? Okay. All right, any questions from you all at the end of our wonderful summit? Angela, do you wanna? Yeah, I'm so glad you're saying that because it's like you don't know what you don't know until it's your eyes are revealed, right? It's revealed. Something is peeled away. And it's this this year that we have started saying, you know, what about VSU, for example, right? And because of we're thinking about extension um in the communities can play a real role and vsu may be that but i i love that you've said that and um i think it's a, a direction we need to go very much just point to me 
to know this, that the third partner is not, actually not Virginia Tech, it's Old Dominion University. No, 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 that's fine. Because you're right, Virginia Tech, they do a lot of work in the resilient space too. So I wanna recognize that. But it is Old Dominion University. And that's actually a wonderful thing because ODU always tells us, you know, we have this role as more of a commuter school than UVA and William & Mary. And I think that that's great because they, they bring in students that might have professional work and are going to school on the side. But you're exactly right about bringing in the HBCUs. But thank you, Angela. Is there another question? I'm trying to see for the spotlight here. Yes, Ben. outcome. Well, all right, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to twist your question a little before I hand this to Tanya to say one of the um, changes in the process that I'm most happy about is pulling in the state agencies because that has been so wonderful. If there's a septic issue, we call, we've called on David. Department of Forestry has been a great partner. You know, VDEM gives us support and sends us information about grant opportunities. So we try to bring in Aaron, right in the middle, right here. He's been wonderful, DCRC's program, um, about talking about what can be done for shoreline erosion control. So I think that um, bringing in the state agencies into the process to, and inviting them to come to the implementation team meetings has been a help to the localities that are you know, challenged in their capacity. And just to find out about what the state can offer is a great thing. So I cheated and I'll let Tanya answer. Yeah. And Elizabeth could answer these. I mean, you know, she's in the thick of it, as you know. Um, you know, the answer is, is it always makes me feel like I should be saying something more profound. Um, because it sounds kind of like simple, simplistic, and like not important. But it's really important. And so I think for me, what was unexpected, like we did not know that this would be probably the biggest value of the RAF um, and the biggest impact was that um, in the in rural under-resourced communities that they may all know each other in the sense of, you know, they hang out together, they're at the ball fields together, you know, they see each other at the library or this or that, but in their world of work, they're working on their work, right? And they're not necessarily networking. And so what we have found is that this process creates a conversation across silos that has not yet happened and creates networks that have not yet happened um, for a cause that they haven't yet thought about and which is the climate resilience. And, and so I think I'm really, I struggle with this, Ben, because I think that just sounds like, well, so what, you know, like what's the big deal about that? But COVID really drove it home for me when um, I saw the power of a pre-established network of people who were pre-connected, knew how to talk with each other, like in my community in Charlottesville when COVID hit, and um, issues of food became huge. How do we get food to people who are now no longer have access to that food? And this network that had taken years to develop all of a sudden went into action. And I know not all communities had that. But so we had the most phenomenal thing happen in the city of Charlottesville because of this network of organizations, probably about 10 different organizations who were all able to work together very effectively because they had started that conversation about five years earlier. And they had not been connected before that, even though they'd all been working on issues of food and hunger, et cetera, right? So it was by bringing them together that somebody else had done. And I think that's what we're doing with the raft is we're starting, 
we're catalyzing, we're animating, raising awareness, bringing people together in a community for a different focus, a different lens, saying, we need to start thinking about this together across our silos. And I don't, I don't, I, I struggle with how to communicate the importance of that. So that's what my struggle is. But I think it is for me the most exciting thing. And you know, I think that our um, the things that are accomplished, hopefully it's gonna change some too in response to the needs out there. So for example, I was listening to you, Lance, when you were presenting. You didn't think so, but I was listening to you. And when you said we're trying to figure out how to get to the individual property owners. I walked out and asked Tanya, how can the raft help with that? That's the way I think that we can help. And, and that list of contacts in the community down in the grassroots at the churches and the, and the various faith communities, I think that could be helpful maybe to try to reach out because those are the trusted messengers that David was talking about. So, um, and there are little things too in a community that sometimes they have a question. So our students did a presentation and helped out Colonial Beach when they had questions about how to incorporate resilience into their comprehensive plan. It's the questions that they don't have the time to address or haven't thought to address. That's not a good example because of course they thought of addressing things in their comp plan. But sometimes in communities, it's things that they hadn't generated that conversation and thought to address that we can help out with. Too. Looking up top to make sure I'm not ignoring you all. Any other questions? Jay, sorry, thank you. Tanya and I are laughing because absolutely, we just recently were talking about that. Thank you, Jay. Um, and you know, to be honest, a lot of it is capacity and funding. We would love to go back and knock on the door of every community and say, here's your scorecard. And here's every little thing that we wanna talk about and see how's it going X years down the road. But it takes capacity. Um, Wetlands Watch is talking about going back to the Eastern Shore. I'm just gonna call out Mary Carson, you don't mind me. Um, to go to the Eastern Shore and talk to the communities that were RAF communities before that uh, about the CRS, the, the National Flood Insurance Program, Community Rating System uh, program to see what they can do to participate in that. Um, and so that's a that's a great follow-up conversation. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to say that uh, in terms of next steps, I think that one thing to keep in mind is the reciprocal relationship between communities and their elected leaders, local boards of supervisors who make very important decisions, particularly regarding uh, land use, zoning, and some really mundane and boring sounding effects, uh, uh, aspects that have really significant impacts on uh, people's lives and livelihoods and where and how they're going to live. And there's a reciprocal, reciprocal relationship because uh, ideally leaders know and show the way forward through a process uh, and at the same time, they have to be responsive to the enthusiasm and concerns that their constituents, the communities bring forward and leaders never want to get too far ahead or out into the uh, exosphere of the comfort level of their constituents. So we have to work both to educate, inform, motivate, uh, persuade communities to take charge of their own welfare, to communicate that as a directive to their leaders so that the leaders will feel comfortable moving forward uh, as people who are subject to uh, campaigning and reelection. So I think yeah. that that is a key part of next steps. You know, if I could wave my magic wand, I think one of the things we found in the Northern Neck was um, formation of resilience committees that um, are enduring past our 18 months with them is we're just seeing the power of that 
because this is exactly what you're talking about. That's really sort of the, the golden egg, if you will, of we really then, there is capacity then in the community to be the communicators, be the network, the nexus for the network, right, around resilience. Um, and, and I would want to somehow go back and, and if I could wave a magic wand, then every community would have their own sort of community-based resilience committee that is across these silos and is serving as that communicator that you're talking about, right? Um, I will note that the DuPont fund gave us money towards uh, working in the Northern Neck and then additional funding towards working in the Middle Peninsula. And they wanted, they were interested in seeing their dollars extended. And so they gave a follow-up grant to VIMS and VCPC to do some septic follow-up work in the area. So I think that um, they saw that as definitely an area that needed some additional attention. Um, trying to reach folks. That's, a, that's another follow-up. It brings to light some of these challenges in these communities that they're facing, very under-resourced communities. Troy. So I'm sorry, I was so depressed I got lost in the question. Um, <laughs> but um, but um, I think so we're the effort that we are really focusing on right now in the Middle Peninsula, we're just beginning to kick off the year of implementation. So that is a great question to ask during and after the end of our year of implementation in the Middle Peninsula in particular. But I didn't want to well, think about the well, I'm gonna ask you in the northern neck, is there Think of. Well, I'm going to tell you about a really silly little example. As, as Tanya said, we want to give you a grand example of how the entire community rebuilt itself from the ground up. But in reality, it's the little things that matter. And so we worked with the town of Whitestone, which is not a very large town. Um, but boy, have they got it going on. Their town manager, he is, he is on it. He's got you know grants coming in for wastewater infrastructure, et cetera. And um, they have a lot of elderly residents and they're not necessarily connected to the internet. And if they are connected to the internet, they're not necessarily on it very often. And so they were trying to figure out how do we get emergency information out to them? And so I called up about a certain kind of grant and they said, no, it's, it's we usually do much bigger things than that. Um, but for example, you could do what King and Queen County, I think it was, they said did, which is put a big flashing sign at the intersection saying storm coming, you know, flooding risk, something like that. But that didn't quite suit the needs of the town because you know, these older folks not always are driving around in the community when a rainstorm's about to hit, right? They, they're probably staying home and not gonna see the flashing light at this intersection. So they decided they really wanted to have a day to pass out emergency radios because that was a, a kind of technology that they felt their senior citizens could really relate to and use and would use. And they'd get the emergency blast alert um, when a bad storm was coming. And um, so we connected them to the community foundation and the community foundation said, that's a great idea. And they wrote a check and they got their emergency radios. 
that is such a simple example that I'm sure you're thinking, oh, well, yawn, but it was just connecting the dots, right? It was just having the connections, connecting the dots and saying this town over here may not be the biggest county getting the most attention, but they have a real need and a very elderly population that's spread out. And there are a lot of elderly on that well, I would mention uh, as another really a, a more, in some ways, a more extreme example in the Northern Neck area of, uh, of the Three Rivers Health District, we've had a very rapidly expanding population of Mennonite and Amish communities, uh, amongst whom internet use is not typical, telephone use is not typical, motorized transportation is not typical. Uh, and so in order to provide things like uh, emergency preparedness communication, uh, risk communication for uh, ongoing, imminent, pending, long-term, medium-term, short-term threats. The key there is to identify who are the trusted sources of information for those specific people and to know literally who is the person that you need to go to, physically go to, to talk to, to get information to, that will then disseminate that <clears throat> in an effective way through a community. And that sort of um, intergroup uh, dynamic and collaboration, I think, is something that we're really importantly working for right now. Yeah, so just a couple of other really tiny examples that, again, it's sort of like we want some grand example, but it's these little tiny things that you, you see the changes that can happen. I'm thinking back to Saxis, um, tiny little town. And one of the things that happened was, and it was very early on when they got the results of the scorecard and they were pouring through it and Florence was coming and they said, oh my gosh, like they said, when, when they were asked like, who's vulnerable, they all started laughing. Well, everybody here is vulnerable, right? Like the whole little town is vulnerable. There's nobody who's not vulnerable. People on Tangier said the same thing. But then they were looking at the scorecard, some of the things, and they said, do we, know, do we know who might be shut in? So they did a door, Florence is coming, they did a door-to-door -door survey in their town to identify, make sure they had everybody's phone number, who, who would need water brought to them, who would need you know, communication, all of this stuff. And, and it was something like, the, they said, because in the beginning they said, we're, we all know each other, we take care of each other, we're good. But it wasn't until they saw that specificity that they said, oh, we still have some more work to do. And so they, I got this, I had no idea this was happening, but I got a call after the hurricane came through from Donna. And she said, I just want to give you a big thank you because we would not have been prepared for this in the way that we needed to be. And, and it's because of this scorecard. So we're like, yes. yes. And she said because of the generation of conversation. And the, and the conversation, that, right, yeah. Again, I think it's the, um, the, com the communication, the connecting of the dots, honestly, whether it's a state agency or a grant program or whatever, um, and that planning. That's the thing we stress so much because when we're there for a year of implementation, we don't have the money, the time, or the expertise to design a new, a new bridge into Chincoteague, right? You know, we can't do those kinds of things. We can't do those kinds of hands-on engineer design projects. But what we can do is generate the conversation, try to make sure that the folks that need to be are at the table and that people are planning ahead and know what to plan for and how, how many elements. You know, Tanya touched on that. How many elements are required in the plan? Because as she noted, a lot of times we'll get, why is that fifth category there? You know, that's not really flooding resilience, but it is, right? And making sure that you know that you have the shelters you need and that the services are provided and how do people get to the shelters and all the things that emergency plans think through, but we just get all the people at the table to express that as well as we can. Good point. Right. Anybody else? Are you ready for lunch? I think that we go to 1230, right? So we have.
According to that, we have five minutes. So. One more example. Just, you know, there's a the, uh, building off of what you've said, David, of, of um, trying to identify who are the trusted messengers is one of the things that's come out. Well, a number of things have come out of the raft that are tools that are available for localities. And just in, in total disclosure, um, we have not done a good job of getting these tools out because of limited capacity, but these tools are really fantastic. Like, how do you help your businesses in your community be prepared for what's coming? And now we know it could be for more than storms. It could be for a pandemic. But so these tools sort of walk, like there's one for businesses, is how do we help our businesses get prepared? There's um, another one for communication, emergency communication. Who are the trusted messengers? And what, what networks are the most important for the communication? So you might make an assumption, well, in the Eastern Shore, the surprise was when we asked, what is the go-to in emergencies that people go to? And we're thinking, well, you know, maybe it's Instagram, it's this, it's that. And it was like, it's Facebook. We need a Facebook page that is around emergencies and everybody goes to Facebook. That's where everybody goes. So it's like, we have created a worksheet around emergency communications to help people think this through to be able to identify, okay, so we have somebody out at Windmill Point, like how are we gonna reach the people at Windmill Point? And put that on that little sheet and then that goes into their emergency communications and they figure out who the trusted messenger is on all that. So we've tried to create tools to help people work their way through this to get to the point that David's been talking about, so. Um, and some of this, you know, there's so much change going on with the flooding. The town of Whitestone is a great example. The older gentleman that was the planning commission chair whom we dealt with, he said, I said, how do you deal with the flooding on Windmill Point Road? He said, well, when I was little, there was this one couple that would always call and say, don't send the school bus today down here because it's flooded. So that was their system because everybody knew each other and it didn't flood as often. He said it didn't flood as frequently, so we could do that. But now things are different and you need a somewhat different system. So there's going to emergency radios. But I want to note also to circle back to Angela's question, the way we started with these three universities um, before my time, actually, the year before I got there, I think yeah. Tanya and my predecessor, Roy Hoagland, whom you all know from BEE, um, were um, working with a group of localities talking about resilience and um, the discussion came up that this would be a great thing to do to have some kind of a report card, which we then altered into kind of a scorecard, because we know that everyone wants to know, did I get the A and who got the F, right? So we made it a scorecard instead of a report card. But um, it, it was a matter of also Old Dominion University had Michelle Covey funded by Sea Grant and by the university. So it was a capacity issue as well. And we have these funders, VEE and the Coastal Zone Management Program and Sea Grant that have been big supporters of the raft process, but we have to fill in and get a private foundation usually to help us, DuPont in this case right now, um, because it's, you know, frankly, it's beating the bushes for funding and that restricts it some. The last administration wrote the raft into the Coast Resilience Master Plan framework, but there was no, there were no dollar signs attached to that <laughs> when they wrote us in. So we appreciate it being written in, but just so you know, FYI, there's not a fountain of funding that is, is funding the RAP. So that's part of the constraint too. All right, I have 1221. Well, thank wow. you all very much for coming and for this discussion. That was great and helpful to us too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.